What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to episode 11 of Eat, Speak, Compete, the podcast where we talk about everything going on in the esports and gaming space on a week-to-week -week basis. I'm your host, as always. My name is Yeso, and I'm joined once again by my co-host, Luke Shimona Hebrew. Welcome back, my friend. Yes, we are back. I know we missed a week. We apologize. Yep. Um, there was a lot going on last week mm -hmm. also, so it's definitely, I can't say, was ideal timing. But we're going to make sure we, we squeeze some of that in. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we're bringing in the, the new and improved lightning round feature this yes. episode. But um, good to be back. Episode 11. Um, and uh, I mean, I mean, I'm just thinking about worlds, so I guess I'll, I'm, I'm excited to talk about that. Yeah. Well, I won't make you wait. We'll start right off the top with uh, some worlds news. Obviously, considering we missed last week, we're going to talk about a little bit of quarterfinals before we really jump into the semifinals that were just played this past weekend. So let's start with quarterfinals. Obviously, we had a lot of talk about predictions. I believe we both ended up 50% on predictions yep. in quarterfinals, and we'll just start off the top with T1 taking out Hama Life 3L. Easy clap. I mean, it was pretty, it was, again, T1's insane right now. Faker in the gang. Uh, and honestly, even after watching uh, semis, just really, really love the roster. Um, so many stars. Uh, I'm so bad with their names, but like the, the jungler. Owner. Owner. Honestly, I, I don't want to say like he's the MVP, right? But it's just like he was so impactful, I felt like, so much mm -hmm. that he just like closed the games out. Especially against Hanwha. I felt like he was just like, he was exactly where he needed to be, and it was just like, you're done. I mean, I know Faker's Faker, and like yeah. Faker does such a good job of supporting his team. You know, I feel like in previous iterations of Faker, he's like, he's the star, he's the front man. But in this iteration of Faker, I feel like he's a total support player, and it will, I really like that. I, I, I agree. I think it's crazy when you look back on his career. He's, I feel like, adopted so many different roles based on the roster, which I think is incredible and just speaks to how good of a player he is and why, um, just more reasons why he is the the GOAT uh, of League of Legends. But yeah, I think it is important to highlight the fact that he plays now uh, more of a shutdown role, right? Mm. Earlier it was like, Faker will carry, he's going to blow open the game. And now it's just like, hey, you can put him up against, for example, a Chovy, who is the primary carry of Hanwha. And Faker is just like, hey, I'm just going to completely neutralize mm -hmm. this threat and let the rest of the map take care of the other business and we'll win games and that is exactly how it went down obviously we got to see the uh Lissandra into leblanc play out really well looked incredible in that series and uh i mean faker just continues to build on that incredible resume yeah they dominated him it was a it was a solid performance from t1 uh we kind of felt like i think i think we kind of felt like this was coming after watching hanwa throughout the groups and, mm -hmm. and whatnot we just were kind of like yeah not not this year over you know? overachieved i at least in my opinion overachieved in the group i know you were you were buying in on hanwa early um obviously disappointing the way they go out but yeah. i think considering how much they struggled like in play-ins and you look at that start and considering they were able to figure things out to the point where they got into a quarterfinal uh i think they can be happy you know not satisfied but happy with the way that they played Solid, so, solid. T1, 3 over Han. What a kick off quarterfinals. Next up was the LPL bout, EDG versus RNG. And this series went a full five games with EDG winning 3-2. In my opinion, not as exciting or interesting of a watch as the score would indicate because it really felt like every game was just a blowout for one side. Uh, and EDG ends up being the one on top, winning game five. Uh, what were your thoughts on that series? Uh, I really like watching EDG, so I actually really like the set in general. Okay. Um, I think they're just like a super fun team to watch uh, when it comes to just like comp selection and stuff like that. But um, it was it, it was one of the situations where I felt like the game did get decided in champion select a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, like so it was like you said, it was a little bit more one sided one way or another because it didn't seem like. Um, there was too much. They were like, oh, they got they got a late game comp. It's like, all right, we'll pick an early game comp or, or vice versa, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then obviously, whichever one won that early game, it, it, it kind of just uh, domino affected, if you will. So, But overall, you know, I, I, I think that uh, the better team definitely won. I think mm -hmm. EDG um, is insane in best of fives. Yeah. So, again, I, I think that um, it's not impossible to take games off of EDG, but I feel like it is so hard to beat them in an actual best of five. And I think that's going to stay pretty true through the whole tournament. Um, and I'm kind of hoping they take it all the way. So, Yeah, it's going to be interesting. More to talk about on EEG later, but they obviously take down uh, RNG. The next series to talk about was Mad Lions against the damn one. Uh, certainly a lot of European and Western fans were a little bit of hopium, 
uh, hoping we could see kind of the return of the Mad Lions from MSI that took Dan one all the way to five games. Wasn't the case this time around. Uh, while a couple of the games were very close, uh, and even game two was one that felt like Mad Lions should have won, uh, it doesn't go their way. They fall 3-0 to Dam one who, through quarterfinals, hadn't lost the game of Worlds. Makes sense. No surprise. Yeah. You know, we, we kind of knew Mad Lions was going to was drop this. I don't think Mad Lions necessarily played poorly. Mm -hmm. uh, I think their roster is obviously super good. Um, but it definitely is not. It's just not the year of, of EU and NA. So mm -hmm. that's fine. We'll get them next time. Definitely a rough one there. And Dam one <laughs> continues to roll. And, you know, obviously there was a little controversy after that series, mm. we won't go super in depth on it, but a person in the Mad Lions organization who claimed to be an owner, Mad Lions came out later to say they're actually not part of the ownership group. They're essentially a content creator, but came out after the series publicly criticizing Mad Lions 80 carry Carzy and saying, oh, if it was up to me, Carzy wouldn't be in. We'd have this sub 80 carry in. Uh, Carzy, I think, had an incredible response, basically saying, hey, this dude doesn't know what he's talking about. Don't care. I'm not gonna let None it. Of you me, should yeah. care. Just let it go. The whole thing was uh, a mess, and obviously, you know, a little bit of egg on the face of Mad Lions. I think they came out with the right response to be like, "Hey, this guy does not represent uh, the the organization in that way." Um, but definitely not the way, you know. Especially after losing a tough series like that, that's not kind of the the taste you want to leave in your mouth after that one. Yeah, absolutely. And again, like you said, they, they made the right response. They did it pretty quick, you know. Yeah. And the, obviously, the player himself, um, Cart Cart Carzy, Carzy mm -hmm. Carzy, he um, has nothing but love for Mad Lions. I saw him continuing to rep it and all that kind of jazz. So it seems like it's it's n nothing too crazy uh, because of the fact that they were able to kind of mitigate the the overall mm -hmm. diminishing effects of the tweet itself. But uh, screw that guy. Get him out of here. Um, <laughs> see you later. Give me your shares back, Chief. Yep. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've, I mean. I'm, I'm excited to see Mad Lions back again, but I'm not giving him my pick'em's vote next time. Okay. Luke learned. Luke learned this year. <laughs> I, I did too. I'm and adapting. I mean, and let's be clear. I was buying in on Mad Lions in groups. Uh, and we got scammed. They, I mean, hey, look, they still got out in second place, but yeah. that was not the Mad Lions that I expected going into this tournament. Speaking of disappointments, let's talk about C9 <sighs> versus Gen G. Uh, obviously. We were hoping the return of the Cloud9 that took out uh, Afrika Freaks a few years ago in quarterfinals was uh, the last time I believe that an NI team got into quarterfinals and that, uh, you know, obviously that was C9 then jumping into top four. That C9 did not show up uh, in the quarterfinals. Genji beats them 3-0. And this is another series kind of similar to Mad where a couple of games, especially game one, one yeah. right? Like Cloud9 goes behind early but they get like a 20 minute ace and all of a sudden kind of blew the game wide open. And it was like, damn, like they might actually win this. They don't end up winning it. Uh, and things just kind of were downhill from there. This is, it was a tough loss uh, to watch, especially with the way that things started. And C9 bows out uh, of the tournament with, I mean, you know, they, they finish okay, but seven losses between uh in nine what is it yeah nine games between groups and quarterfinals that's a that's a rough showing yeah after again watching game one you think to yourself oh there's hope here mm -hmm. like you said it just went straight downhill after that it just uh, it's not our year okay in a eu we tried we yeah. were in there again like you said it's not like we played super bad it's not like you know I, I even feel like i even feel like in that set specifically i even feel like we like did okay in, in champ select in the originally but then mm -hmm. we just like couldn't change and we were just like stuck in the momentum of picking the same team comp over and over again and like mm -hmm. really trying to just like jam it in and comfort picks and all that kind of jazz i i, I feel like a lot of people fall victim to, to comfort picks in in worlds because like you're on such a big stage, right? You're like, yeah. you know, you're like, all right, these are my different options ahead of time, whatever it is. But then it's always like, if I had to pick one, you know, if it's like me, dude, if I'm going to turn, I'm playing Wukong the whole time, sure, because he's like my guy, you know. So it's, it's like that. I feel like that hit C9 a little hard. Um, and I think we said this a little bit earlier that we'd love to see uh, Cloud9 run it back next year. I know we're going to talk about that probably a little bit later in the podcast yeah. overall, but I do think Cloud9 had a roster that had more potential than it showed through. Yeah. Um, but I regardless, I even feel like they got too far in the tournament. Like, I, I feel like if any North American team should have been there, it should have been 100 Thieves to at least, you know, get their shot at it, you know? Yeah. But 
whatever. It's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm super excited for the rest of Worlds, regardless uh, of NA and EU being out. Um, but I think we put on a decent show this year. So, yeah, I would say. I, mean, I guess in comparison, who? I mean, <laughs> I, I would say when you look at kind of the history of North American performances at international events, uh, and specifically because the conversation every single year is how do we improve? Was this better? Did we make progress? I don't think we did this year. I would say this year was a step back. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of talk after groups and then specifically after quarterfinals talking about North America kind of holistically in terms of their progress at international events. And for me, the conversation seemed to be too positive. You know, I don't want people out here totally dragging players. I'm not looking to be uh, just, you know, hate you know, watching uh, this kind of stuff and saying, you know, North America's trash, this and that. But I would say my critical look at this year and their performance at Worlds, and they just didn't do that great. You know, I think you can look at TL and, and 100 Thieves and be like, hey, they both went three and three. Yeah. Hey, they both took games. You know, we, they, saw, we saw 100 Thieves take a win. Though. Not really, though. I mean, in comparison, look at, look at the, we're talking about like Worlds appearances, though, right? Like if, I, if we're talking like Perks and Sven, incredible international experience and even blabber uh you know nothing last year but played at msi so c9 little young right look at the other side someday incredible mm -hmm. amount of international experience who he bunch of international experience uh maybe the rest of the roster uh, a little younger on that side, but you can even look at Closer, who, when he was in the TCL, got to go to international events when he was in the TCL. You look at TL, that is a roster stacked with international experience. Alfari, mm. Santorin, Jensen, Core JJ, even Tactical played at Worlds last year. So, like, there are some parts where you can be like, hey, these guys are a little young. But you can also look at T1, and I know T1's a different story. But they're like They the had youngest. three players yeah. <laughs> all playing in their first international event. So, like... That excuse is only going to work so long. Right. And especially, especially when you're bringing some of some players with an incredible wealth of international experience under their belts. So, you know, I, I agree. You know, we talked about it a little last week on our unrecorded uh, podcast that, you know, we would like to see these teams run it back. Yeah. At least Again, we'll at least talk about that a little more in a little bit, but, um, I would say they underachieved, at the very least. I have higher expectations for these crop, crops of talent because I think when I look at just just looking at the 15 players on the starting rosters that we sent in North America, I think this year we sent pound for pound like the most talented crop of players we've ever sent from North America. Mm. And that's including uh, multiple years where Bjergsen and Doublelift were going to Worlds at the same time. I think pure talent-wise, we sent Perks, Sven, Someday, Core JJ, Who He, Abadage, FBI. I think these players are incredible, and I think they underachieved. I mean, it's fair. You know, when you when you look at it in that sense, um, I think that regardless of like their, I guess international experience yes. per se, right? Like I, I felt like this year was a little different I mean, in comparison to previous years. Mm -hmm. If we're talking just like the speed of the meta, um, sure. we're talking like, um, I know a lot of these uh, players, especially COVID purposes, right? Like didn't necessarily get the same level of practice and things like that mm -hmm. that they might've been able to experience in the past. Sure. Um, when, you know, that might practice regimen wise, which I, don't, which I think North America is easily the worst mm -hmm. at. Um, so I think that affects us even more like, you know, in the COVID sense where, you know, you have like the Korean teams, obviously everyone's affected with, with the, with the, whole, the, the, the pandemic across the board. But um, depending on your overall practice regimen, it's, it could be a lot easier to mm -hmm. like continue improving, building your rosters, et cetera. So, I mean, I, I get what you're saying and, and I can't fully disagree by any means. Like sure. you sent a very, very talented uh, roster of players this yeah. year for sure. Um, but again, I, I, I honestly do feel like a lot of it was not even mechanical based. You know, I felt like a lot of it was shot calling yep. and champ select and things like that, which are all meta based, you know, conversations that it's like, OK, we were clearly like the real conversations. We were clearly unprepared on the strategy side mm -hmm. for like coming in here thinking we could just pick these this exact comp every time, get in there and win games. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I would have liked to see a lot more. I mean, just even just fakers character selection 
like his roster is, must be ginormous. Yeah. It's terrifying. You can't even ban him out. It's impossible. You have to spend half your bans banning out his characters, and then he hasn't even picked from his main character pool yet. Mm-hmm. So, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like there was a lot of that that I saw with the North American teams that, sent, that seemed a little limited, which might have made it easier for these more um, strategical teams to just really counter him out and ban him out. So, mm-hmm. I don't know. I hear what you're saying, though. It makes sense, and, and I, I would like to see some of these teams run it back overall, but even more, I'd, I'd love to see... Uh, a lot more shifts in North America when it comes to the overall practice component and champ select and strategizing and all that kind of jazz. Like, I just feel like it felt pretty uh, linear, and mm-hmm. I felt like that's not how draft should be. So yeah. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. but No, I, I agree. I agree. And I, it's going to be, obviously, an ongoing conversation over the offseason, and then, obviously, as play starts in 2022, it'll all kick in again. Yeah. One North American team will start popping off. Everybody will get their hopes up. Oh, is this the squad to finally deliver for NA? And then we'll get to an international event. And, you know, chances are we'll probably be disappointed, but hopefully not. We'll see. Yeah, you know, I've really only watched, like, the LCS this season. Sure. Like, I didn't watch a lot of, like, the LEC and the uh, LPL and all I didn't that. as well. I watched and, definitely a lot of But I kind of feel like I wish I did because, like, I, again, I didn't really have a good scope of, like, the... Um, like everyone's just overall like meta picks too mm-hmm. much, just like North America's primarily. So when I was, I was like, oh my gosh, yeah. Like so, I don't. I mean, obviously they probably did more research than I did, but I was pretty caught off guard overall. Sure. So you know, let's jump to semifinals. So that wraps it up for quarters. Uh, obviously left us with T1, EDG, Damwon, and Gen G. Uh, and we'll start with the first semifinal, which was Damwon and T1, Ooh. the rematch of the summer finals out in the LCK. And Damwon wins it. Three to two in what was, I think, an absolute classic series. Um, With the exception of one game. (laughs) With the exception of one game. I think it was very, very entertaining. A back and forth series. Uh, A series where T1 puts Damwon on match point after three games. And Damwon's got to come back. And I think... Uh, Showmaker stepped up big time and they were talking a lot about you know one of the quotes you know obviously Riot does all this great production stuff around uh, these international events and they film these really cool teasers and one of the great quotes from the kind of teaser interstitials that they did for semifinals was they had this great quote from Showmaker talking about you know hey after this series I don't want to be known as the next faker I want to be known as the first Showmaker and one that's so perfect because of how their names interact uh, and second of all, I thought that was incredible, and I think that Showmaker did that. I think he had a great series, specifically finished very strong, and not that, like, Faker's career is dead by any means. I think he's still going to come back just as strong as ever next year, and this roster will be stronger. But uh, I think Showmaker, as well as Damwon, are standing on the precipice of defining themselves as the next great dynasty in League of Legends esports and specifically in Korea. Okay, but how are you going to let him pick Ziggs in game five? <laughs> like, what? I, again, this is what I'm talking about. Like, who's sitting behind the desk that says, yeah, don't ban Z- Ban Ziggs, dude. Get me out of there. But that was just a tidbit on that piece specifically. Sure. <laughs> but overall, I totally agree. I loved, I loved the series. I thought it was an absolute blast to watch. Game four was hilarious because mm-hmm. you're sitting here, like, on the edge of your seat, and then game four, down one walks down the roll. <laughs> they, just, they just landed on the table, bro. And you're, after game four, I was like, T1 is screwed. Yeah. I was like, you, I mean, good fight. You guys are screwed. Yeah. Um, they really just, I mean, they absolutely targeted Faker, and they just had the, they just had the, the matchup. It was just, he couldn't, he couldn't do anything. He's mm-hmm. flashing underneath his turret at full HP and just getting absolutely pounded yeah. the whole game. He's like 0-5 because they're just like, his flash is down, go! And like <laughs> triple ganking him over and over again. But um, it was a super cool uh, series to watch. I love watching Faker again. We talked about in that support role Mm -hmm. where, um, again, the jungler. I always forget his name. Oh, owner. Owner. So good in the series. Mm -hmm. Such just so perfect. Um, Absolutely crushing. A top laner also, uh, Kenan. He played Kenan most of the time. Mm -hmm. Kana. Kana. Mm -hmm. Uh, Also super, super good. I was Mm -hmm. really enjoying watching that. and honestly, the bot lane seemed kind of irrelevant a lot of the times, I felt like. Because, you know, they were back and forth. They, I think one of the games um, they really did, like, I think it was, like, the Thresh, like, Graves game or something. Yeah. Like, they, like, really, really, like, held down the game for a while. But overall, it was really like a, a jungler in mid, like, throwdown. Yeah. You know, it was really just, like, who can who can control that lane and then who controls the objectives. Because well, we saw... And when you look <laughs> at the other side where that jungle bid duo is Showmaker and Canyon. Yeah. And I think Canyon 
you know, you want to talk about he Showmaker crazy. and, and Damwon trying to set up, like, the next great Korean dynasty. I think Canyon is quickly approaching, like, goat jungler status. He is incredible. Dude, the J4 he is engages, so good. man. Mm-hmm. Just... It was just like, oh, you, your whole team lost all their summoners, <laughs> and uh, the fight hadn't started yet. Yeah. So, good luck. And also, here's all my shields, and, like, mm-hmm. I was really, really loving the... I know that we had a lot of J4 throughout the whole weekend, but um, I thought I thought those games with him were, like, just so just... Engaged, you lost. Like, yeah. You, just, you felt like T1 lost the fight before it started, like, so many times. Yeah. He just flashes in and leaps halfway across the map. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, cr- credit to T1. You know, obviously, it's disappointing that they go out here. Um, but when you look at that roster and when uh, top jungle and AD carry are all playing in their first international event, yeah. I mean, the sky's the limit for this roster. Uh, I think Gumayushi and Karia are going to be a huge threat as a bottom lane in the future. Uh, they look great. I thought Gumayushi looked really, really he good in quarterfinals. He, he did. Almost I, saved and it, I yeah. think he still had a good series. Uh, I think this roster, I really, this is one I 100% want to see this roster run back next season because another year under their belt, I think this is then a very different T1. You know, they weren't favorites by any means coming into this tournament, um, but I think they really made a statement in this world uh, and even in that series that, hey, T1's coming back. Yeah, it was. You know, it's so funny because, like, again, game four and game five even, like, they weren't very close. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, again, it was a super sick series, but, like, after, like, game four, like, they just smashed them, mm-hmm. right? But then in game five, too, it was, like, it looked a lot closer than it was, but, like, it was, well, a, it it was just, a straight objective wash. The, the, the image I kept having in my head was it was just, like, T1 was out in the middle of the ocean just on, like, a little rickety raft, and damn one was just that big, great white was just circling <laughs> waiting for their moment it, yeah. and as soon as they got it i mean it was the whole the whole dance around uh getting uh dragon soul and then the baron and going back and forth and that was just it was incredibly tense that last game was so so tense and i agree that it was uh, more lopsided than it looked because it was just damn one was being incredibly patient they refused mm. to make a play that they so didn't good. feel was like 90 95 percent success rate because they were just like look if we just play mistake free league of legends right now we win it doesn't matter how good their composition is and they executed it beautifully it was really cool to watch i agree so it was an awesome set damn one moves on they're the first one to jump into the world finals Did let's go to the get other series wrong? no i picked i picked damn one did you pick t1 Oh uh, yeah, no, I got both of my quarter or mo- both of my semifinals right. Never did. You're dumb. <laughs> I yeah. hate it here. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> uh, EDG Gen G, and this was a match going in that personally, you know, one I I predicted EDG to win because I thought they were the better team, but also I very much wanted EDG to win because I really didn't want to see another LCK versus LCK final. We've seen enough of those. I also just didn't think that Gen G was going to give either T1 or Dam1 a real test. Um, so EDG and Gen G play, uh, and this is similar to Dam1 situation. EDG goes down 2 1 and then wins games four and five uh, to advance to their first ever Worlds final. To be clear, EDG had never gotten past quarterfinals at Worlds until this season, and this is now their first international final for the organization since they won. MSI in 2015. That was when they beat Faker at the first ever actual wow. MSI in 2015. So crazy run for EDG, and they beat Genji in a series where uh, I don't know. I thought BDD was looking really good early, and I was just like, dang, like that was the one thing that Genji really needed. It was like if BDD can come out and pop off, they can advance. But Scout and Viper and the rest of EDG came back in games four and five and looked really, really good. Let me break this down for you, okay? His name is Lee Sin. Okay, <laughs> Lee. Tell me more. Sin. Okay. No, I, I said it a bunch for literally every podcast, pretty much since we started talking about worlds. EDG is absolute monster and mm-hmm. best of five sets. Like you can just see it there. They're just such units. Mm-hmm. They just come out there with such powerful comp selects, and they're like they drop a game and then they come back the next game with like a whole different roster and they just annihilate. So yeah. I, I love I love their their range. Um, and their, their ability to adapt to specific play styles and teams, which I think is, again, I think they're the best at it. So I'm super, super excited for finals. Because I think it's going to be just like, 
I think it's going to be so interesting on what kind of uh, team fight comps stuff like that we end up seeing uh, them pull out. But um, it was a good set. You know, it was honestly fun mm -hmm. to watch. I don't know why you wouldn't ban Lee Sin. I honestly feel like they could. I, I feel like it <laughs> honestly could have gone the other way yeah. um, because I, I felt like he was such a such a superstar throughout mm -hmm. the title. They just like changed. And I mean the. I'm pretty sure we saw some Baron steals. I'm pretty sure we saw like we saw it all. We had a bunch of yeah, we had steals through yeah. through the knockout the stage period. Thing, yeah. Like quarterfinals and semis was incredible. So but, I was uh, a big fan overall. I didn't get to uh, again, like you know, I haven't finished that whole series, mm -hmm. like watching the whole game all the way through yet. Mm -hmm. I kind of had to speed through it for this, but um, I am excited to watch a little bit more in detail some of the lane phases and stuff. But yeah. Um, Overall, I am excited that uh, EDG won, and I really want to see them in a best of five set against Dom one again. So yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting to watch finals this weekend. I would say Dam one probably come in as pretty, I don't know, pretty sizable, maybe an exaggeration, but I would definitely say they're favorites oh, coming for into sure. this I'm series. I'm not picking them though. Um, really, you're going to pick EDG? I got to try. Hope pick. Okay, I'm. I'm hoping you know, you're picking all the way. I personally don't care who wins typically every yeah, year i have one either. team that i'm like yeah. i would really love to see this team win i think i think it's an incredible story either way either way you get either uh the damn one dynasty uh you know really starting here with their back-to-back -back title or you get edg with their best run at worlds already finally winning that title uh that it feels like they've come into tournaments so many times over the past you know four or five years where it's been like damn EVG looks really sick this year this could be your, their year and they never even could get past quarterfinals so uh, I think it's a win-win for the viewer I think it's going to be a really fun series uh do you have do you have a prediction right now um I will say um oh, okay I'm, I'm gonna give two answers okay my my Luke, answer my, prepare for Luke to hedge his bets. My answer as an analyst <laughs> yeah. oh, okay. uh, for the LCS. So if you guys are gonna hire me, yeah, uh, I would say uh, three one, Dan one. Okay, I would say is what I would expect if I had to put money on it. Yeah. Now in all reality, based on what I've seen and my my hopium in EDG's game five flexibility, I would say uh, let's let's bring it to game five and give it to EDG. Mm -hmm. My. My safe bet would be 3-1, damn one. Yeah. But when I look at this series, I think that Ghost and Barrel have been less of a weakness for damn one in these, this world than I think a lot of people were predicting. But I think that Viper is such a threat in the bottom lane that I actually think EDG is going to be able to find ways to build leads through bot in this series. I actually can see them taking two games, but I still think damn one wins just because I think Showmaker and Canyon are mm -hmm. disgusting. And I think also Khan has been playing incredible in top lane. Uh, if he gets Kennen in the series, he's going to make EDG's life hell. So I'm still leaning towards the damn one, but I'm actually going to say three, two. I think we go the distance. I hope we do. I hope we do because the last five games we got in a world's final was 2016 and i can tell you from experience because i was literally there that game five was a letdown mm. because that was when skt went two up over it was it was funny i remember skt goes up 2-0 in this series against samsung galaxy mm. and you could just feel all the energy just sucked out of the building it was at staples center and you could just tell everybody was just like oh waiting for t you know skt to win and then all of a sudden Samsung starts making that comeback in game three and you could just hear everybody start to oh oh it could be happening and then game four was incredible and then the energy was insane to start game five and then Samsung just gets bodied in laning phase because literally if you watch my favorite part is if you go back and watch the official like riot highlight tape from 2016 worlds when they go through the highlights of that series There's it like ends game four and it's like Play the Silver Scrapes. We're going to game five. And literally the next highlight is, is T1, T1 taking winning. the Nexus in game five. So it literally is just like, yeah, there's nothing else <laughs> worth watching in this game. So I hope we get to game five and really get an absolute banger finish. Uh, I think that these teams can deliver it. I think it's going to be a fun one. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, I'll see you at five. Let's, yeah, right. We'll be up early. Uh, let's continue uh, with the last bit of league news here couple of big roster news this mm. past week Bjergsen leaving TSM and Perks looking to leave C9 couple of the biggest names in the mid lane in the west 
uh, just a couple of the big, biggest names, period, in Western League of Legends, and they're going to be leaving, making a change. I mean, uh, uh, it's, <laughs> hey, C9, run it back. By the way, see you later, yeah, um, I, It's interesting. You know, I know there's a lot of roster swaps that always happen at this kind of stage. The Bjergsen yeah. piece, obviously, is the most interesting because he's been such a integral part of TSM for a while now. Even scooping up some eight years, eight years he's been with the org. Scooping up some ownership a couple years back. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he secured the bag. I think his um, competitive itch was probably just rocking and rolling. And now I'm that he's surprised. got the bag, he's probably just like, now I just want to be in the history book, dude. You know, like, let's get let's get North America into world's vibes. Like, we were talking about this a little bit yesterday. Mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine it's anything else, mm -hmm. you know, because he could stream, he could do content, he can, he can do whatever he wants, and he knows that. But, like, he's choosing to go directly, deliberately back, which means he's looking for something specific. What that is, I'm excited to know. Like, I don't know if it's a specific player that he thinks, you know, he can take all the way with him or whatever it might be. But regardless, or if it's just the meta and his characters are back in and he's ready to yeah. jump on the ride. But uh, regardless, I think that's super interesting. I'm excited to see what he ends up doing. So before we jump to perks, yeah, let's I'll, I'll give a little more background on what's going on with Bjergsen. Okay. Rumor has it, uh, according to a report from Upcomer, that uh, he is heavily in talks to join Team Liquid. And apparently... Team Liquid is considering trying to roll swap Jensen to AD to carry. AD right? carry. Um, also, rumor has it that Alfari is out, their top laner. Apparently, Alfari will be joining uh, another big name player in Europe on a certain team that we'll talk about in a little bit. But no Alfari. Okay. Bjergsen in and mid, supposedly, with Jensen possibly going to the bot lane. So, what is that? How does that strike you? Was. Was Bjergsen ever on TL? No, Bjergsen has always played for TSM in North America yeah, since he came from Copenhagen Wolves. So, it's kind of interesting. I don't really see... Uh, I'm confused why. I guess I, I guess I just need to see the whole roster in order to, like... Yeah, I mean... Because it, it's like, that's 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 like, like, what? Why? I mean, the opportunities it opens up... Uh, I was listening to, to some discussion about this late last week. Okay. Um, Core JJ is rumored to possibly be getting his green card. What that would do would then open up another import slot. So Alfari leaving, Alfari was an import. If Core JJ gets his green card and they keep either Jensen going to bottom lane or they keep tactical and move Jensen somewhere else, that opens you up to import both top and jungle if you want. Obviously, they can still look back, look to bring back Santorin. Uh, obviously, he's had medical issues throughout the year, so that's a more complicated conversation. But there are opportunities for TL to make some big moves here. Um, it's hard to say how this roster is going to end up because I think especially if Core JJ gets that green card, it opens up a crazy amount of possibilities for how you can build out the rest of the top side of the map. I don't know how it works out, but I would say, you know, and I tweeted about it last week. I was like, I would say this has maybe probably a 75% chance of failing in terms of like Jensen going bot. I know right. they're trying to replicate the whole perks and caps thing that G2 did a couple of years ago. You know, I don't know. I'm not sold. I'm not sold. And I, I, look, I, I would love to be proven wrong. I would yeah. love for Jensen to go down there and be like, this makes sense. And obviously there's still mages in the bottom lane that makes sense. Uh, but, you know. I think the the whole caps perks thing that G two did is the exception to the rule, and I think you can certainly look and be like, "Hey, it was the two best mid laners in Europe, and we're just doing it with the like historically two best mid laners in NA." But uh, I'm not, I'm not sold. It's a wait and see moment. You know, yeah. I'm pre I'm pretty excited because I'm not sold either, but I love the concept of them going mm -hmm. for it. Sure. You know what I mean? Because again, we talked about the meta and like the international, um, mm -hmm. like the gameplay. How it's like a lot different in that sense a lot of times. And this is something where it is very different. You can get in there and you can be like, all right, even if it's not our our comfort pick or our main go to, it's like, you know, we're having a lot of issues in this sense. Like, let's, you know, we can switch it up. You know, yep. we got two mid laners in the bot lane, so yeah. we got a lot of flexibility. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I would be, I'm super interested to see like what ends up happening. They should just pick up the five best north or North American mid laners and fuck it, just throw them, <laughs> just throw them all in there, dude. Just take every lane. It's I've seen crazier things happen. Like, oh, the four best, and we'll, we'll grab a, we'll grab our jungler for yeah. us. But yeah, it's gonna be weird. Uh, so we'll have to see how things continue to pan out. Obviously, nothing is set in stone uh, until free agency opens. I believe on the fifteenth of yeah. this month. That is when Bjergsen could officially sign that contract, and we'll see how things shake out with the whole Jensen situation in the bot lane. But a lot of things to watch 
with Team Liquid. Uh, let's jump to Perks. Obviously said he's leaving C9. Uh, reports have come out over the weekend uh, and specifically yesterday that he is reportedly going to be joining Vitality. Oh. And apparently Alfari, now former Team Liquid top laner, is supposed to be joining him uh, out there. Oh. Uh, as well as possibly Vitality is in talks to get Karzy. Oh. He is going to be a free agent in a couple of weeks. And it would appear that while no deal has been agreed upon yet, they are in talks to bring Karzy in. So this Vitality roster, and I'm, I think they're trying to get self-made as well. The former Fnatic jungler yeah. who was incredible. That top side, Alfari, self-made perks, disgusting. If you get Karzy in, like, that is a, it's a, that is a crazy roster. Yeah. roster. Uh, so, but perks, uh, from a, a C9 point of view, it's a bummer to see him going. I know NA was obviously excited to have him, and he came in in this big blockbuster deal to come to C9, and after a year see and a couple of failed international attempts. See ya. Bye. Yeah. Hasta luego. Yeah, it's a bummer for sure. Um, I liked having perks on him. I'm not sure what Cloud9's plan is for next year, because I kind of feel like they built around him. So, uh, yeah. Back to the drawing board. Yeah. That one's going to stink. <laughs> it's going to... I mean, honestly, though, like... Yeah. You know, we were talking about it on our unrecorded episode. It's, you know, we want to see him run it back, and now we can't. So. Yeah. What are you going to do? Yeah. A lot, uh, lot of big roster news to keep an eye on for North America and Europe. It's going to be a very crazy offseason. Uh, on to other news, though. We talked a lot of league here at the front. Uh, let's talk a little bit of esports business news and some of the biggest esports news over the last couple of weeks. FaZe Clan is going public mm -hmm. with a proposed valuation of one billion dollars one what are your thoughts on this luke i know this is kind of right up your alley yeah you know i'm i'm pretty interested in it phase clan is such an interesting uh esports org right because we're dealing with like the og frat boy gang right <laughs> like just the as as og as esports uh, really gets you got the, the phase and the optic boys and you know, for a long time, like, again, they weren't really, like, a business. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It was just, like, a club. You know? It's, like, face, face Yeah, game, right? You know? And, like, I mean, it started as literally, like, Call of Duty montages mm -hmm. on so YouTube. So, it's so interesting to see, like, them go from there to really turning into, like, a fully functional, like, production mecca that mm -hmm. owns, like, so much talent, does so many, like, huge deals in the space, still uh, giant teams and, you know, Call of Duty and, um, what was they playing? Counter-Strike and, you know, all the other fields that they, that they compete in. Um... And, and, you know, they're, they're even, like, front runners in a lot of, like, you know, things like they mess around with, like, NFTs. They have huge, like, online, like, such as, like, YouTube, like, gaming communities. Right? Like, they're ginormous. And their mm -hmm. overall, if we're talking, like, reach of, like, impressions and uh, influence and stuff like that, it's pretty, it's up there. It's, like, I, I would say probably top five for sure. Maybe sure. top three. Um, I know TSM is number one. Um, but I know that they're, they're definitely up there when it, when it comes to overall reach, mm -hmm. which is pretty much, like, a huge component of evaluation. Sure. So... With TSM not being worth a billion dollars, I can tell you for sure that they're not worth a billion dollars. So that was so my... I would like to circle back to say, like, <laughs> extraordinarily impressive. Yes. They're not worth a billion dollars. But yes. I want to preface that with one other piece, which is just that it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's, it's about the opportunity to be able to... It's like NFTs, right? It's like the opportunity to be able to own it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? People are super into NFTs because it's like, oh, it's the only one this. Or like, oh, Face Clan's releasing limited this and that. It's like, it's, I kind of look at it almost like the same way where it's like... Just being a partial owner, like they're always trying to give ownership to the audience, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's what they've been doing for a long time. The whole be a face claim member for a day, and like remember that? Yeah. Um, if you guys didn't see that, they literally like released on their Twitter like a, a do like a legally binding document that literally like allowed you to be part of Face Clan for a day if you just like signed it and posted it or whatever, right? Yeah. So, uh, I really like where their internal like model is going, and like that they're it seems like they're trying to build a path of like a you know a a specific like new gen type of esports org rather than being kind of in stuck in the old days because it is evolving right and we, we talk about this on the show every once in a while where it's kind of a race for a lot of these esports orgs to claim like their slot in um you know there can only be one lakers and there's mm -hmm. only be you know what i mean like you can be the clippers but you can't be the lakers you sure. know we can't have four teams that are all the lakers like someone's got to be the clippers and someone's got to be the spurs you know <laughs> like sure. it's just how the world works and in this sense it's the same way where they're really trying to separate themselves it's like okay we have the talent, we have the name, we have the history. Now mm -hmm. let's give ourselves to the public. And of course, you know, they're going public. They're still going to own plenty of the percentage or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, and they'll probably make a ton of money. 
So, and clearly they have the financials and the um, the cash flow to show their numbers publicly and, mm-hmm. and be able to prove that the business model is working with all their merch sales and their sponsorship deals, et cetera. So overall, I know I ranted there for a while, but overall, um, I think it's hilarious. You know, I love the number. They, they're all in big, big boy flex. Yeah, uh, They're not worth it. Will I buy some? Probably some just to say I own it, obviously. <laughs> but overall, you know, I'm interested to see how it goes because this is a big step for esports mm-hmm. and a team like FaZe Clan doing it first um, is a really big deal. Couple of additional details, uh, future plans for them uh, that they have talked about since this announcement include uh, they want to go international, doing NFTs, branded peripherals, and even potential food partnerships, I've heard. Uh, and they are considering expanding into League of Legends, Wild Rift, Halo, Free Fire. I have no idea what that is. I've Mobile. never heard of that. Okay. And uh, Apex Legends, which is very cool. So uh, that's all cool stuff. My first blush reaction was the same as yours. They're, they're not worth a billion dollars. Now, my question to you is, and I don't know if you have an answer for this, is uh, are there significant drawbacks to an inflated uh, valuation out the gate when going public? Are there like big, you know, drawbacks that they can have to that if it isn't worth that much? Um, well, you can, you know, I can make a t-shirt and sell it for $10,000. doesn't mean someone's going to buy it. You know what I mean? Yes. So if, if anything, it's more of like a publicity component, right? Okay. Where it's like if, you're, if your stock isn't selling well, especially like in an IPO type situation, like it can hurt your overall like opening stock number, right? If they, mm-hmm. if they do an evaluation of a billion dollars, right? And everyone's buying in at a billion dollars. And then like once it actually goes live, you turn out that the stock that you bought or whatever, it's, let's say I bought $100, it's only worth 40 bucks. Sure. So you know what I mean? So, it's so more, it really hurts the consumer it can, then. It can, okay. you know what I mean? But again, it's like if the community gets behind it, and they're all, oh, cool, we can own FaZe Clan, like, you know what I mean? Like, which is, in a case, is relatively true, you know what I mean? Like, the com- which I think is what FaZe Clan is going for. FaZe Clan is literally like, you know, again, we have the foundation, we have the talent, we have the money, we have the, the financial backing and the infrastructure, we have it all. Mm-hmm. All we're missing, really, is like, you know, let's say new gen popularity. So now it's like, okay, new gen, own a portion of FaZe Clan and help us choose what we, what we do, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, they're trying to give that ownership to the community, and if the community accepts that ownership and runs with it then, then it totally can, could be worth a billion dollars could just push them right up to that number do you know what okay. i mean like yeah. it's it's absolutely possible because if people are you know it's only, every, so really it's everything's just, worth what you're willing to pay for and if people are willing 100%. to pay for it they'll be worth it okay interesting so we'll have to see uh how this shakes out um phase going public that's and i agree i think it's you know esports is going to continue to jump into all these different spaces uh you know, we see it with, you know, Hunter Thieves and FaZe and Optic, uh, how defining they are in like lifestyle brands and all the merchandising and all these incredible things. We see all the different partnerships that are coming out. And this is just the next step in esports orgs continuing to just be trailblazers. Um, I'm curious to see what the next big step is and who is going to take it. But, you know, hey, congratulations to FaZe. Yep. I'm very curious to see how it pans out. I hope it goes well. I'll let you know how it goes. I'll yeah. be in there. <laughs> Luke's going to be giving me the stock updates every morning when I come into the office. Phase is up, baby. Let's go. We're going to the moon. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, let's talk about a PR firestorm. Uh, obviously, we're coming in a little late to this story. We would have been on time with it last week, but obviously some things happened. But let's talk about Valkyrie and Reflex. So Ray came out a couple of weeks ago to announce she was the co-founder uh, and kind of the celebrity face of reflect a skincare brand and the internet bodied her uh and it was very specifically about the claims from the company and from ray that this product was going to give you blue light protection from your screens and stuff and the entire internet came out and said your screens aren't messing up your skin with blue light Uh, Here's a great quote from the website before it was later taken down. Uh, However, we do not guarantee that all information provided on this site is accurate, complete, reliable, current, or error-free, and we disclaim any liability arising out of any errors to the extent permitted by the law. (laughs) 
what what in what world, bro? We reserve the essentially we reserve the right to make whatever claims we want and not be liable for it all being bullshit. Yeah, that's very it's very accurate <laughs> of essentially what happened. I mean, I would say you know it's again obviously guys do your own research, take a look at it, whatever you want to do. But I would say TLDR of this overall situation, would just looking at it is like seems like everybody kind of got scammed. You know what I mean? Like, it seems sure. like, it, it just, it's just confusing because, like, she was kind of all like, oh, like, they said they were going to post all these studies that they mm -hmm. did. And he's like, that which means, I'm assuming she maybe saw the studies, but then they were like, no, we can't post the studies because it's like, you know, it's our intellectual property, yeah. and which is like the biggest load of horse shit I've ever heard. Oh, 100%. Because it's like, but it's then like, but if you, I'm sorry, but if you actually do like studies on like, like how to protect your body more and like release this blue line product like why wouldn't you want us to have that information and like are you afraid of competitors competitors would prove that your product works mm -hmm. like I'm, I'm confused on their their concept there but and then like and then she like leaked some dms that she had with like ludwig where they were like well, she didn't it was ludwig's friend was playing on his pc for i think a twitch rivals mm. and accidentally leaked it then on stream the conversation so, so she basically pulled out right she completely bailed like, again like she's she was like the co-founder which i'm yeah. assuming was mostly financial so i'm mm -hmm. assuming that she took kind of a financial blow in this whole old scenario but mm -hmm. with her being the figurehead i doubt she had to put too much in overall but mm -hmm. it's probably not that big of a deal for her i'd say on the financial end it was probably more of like a a a brand issue. It's a big PR for it was, her. It was really big. It was a really unfortunate. So you know, it'd be nice for her just to kind of fall on the sword, own up to the fact that she made a mistake, which she kind of did. But again, it's just I feel like I feel like it was just like I feel like it was pretty clear cut. It was did just you like, see her response? The the, 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 the initial one on the stream yeah. where she was oh, yeah, where was she good. started calling people out. That was not good. Yeah, she I, doubled I, down, and it was just like everybody was like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> like, yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty awk. Uh, across the board, I'm not a fan of the overall experience. Mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, I know a lot of people really kind of came out and were just like, if you're going to release a product, especially that like has claims like that, mm -hmm. you have to know what you're talking about. Sure. You know what I mean? To say that you're a co-founder to this and that, again, I'm not trying to just sit here and rag, but it's like you, you are an influencer. <laughs> you have to know what you're saying because you're influencing yeah. millions of people. So... Overall, it was a super unfortunate situation. When I first saw it, I was super excited about it too because I was like, oh, that sounds so cool. Like, I didn't even know that was a thing. Turns yeah. out it's not. But um, overall, it was a super unfortunate situation. It seems like it's just going to end up disappearing. Like, it, she it's failed. Dead. The website's down. Yep. You can't buy the makeup anymore. Yep. She's not a part of it anymore. I doubt we'll see an announcement about it anymore. It's just a big meme, essentially. Mm -hmm. But uh, I definitely think that it could have gone worse, and mm -hmm. I definitely think she could have handled it better. I would say, first of all, if literally this entire thing goes down and there's just no talk or anything about the blue light protection, this goes out goes off without a hitch. She gets to release a, a product she is happy about. She gets to jump into the skincare business, advertise it to a lot of her fans, probably get a lot of people who aren't into skincare into it, and it's probably a great thing. It is literally just the blue light stuff and the fact that it was essentially a lie because there are peer-reviewed studies out there that say that blue light from screens is not in any way a significant threat to your skin. Uh, so, and, and that was the whole big pushback. Yeah. In the grand scheme of things, I 100% believe that Ray got scammed, but partially I think she asked for it because it, yeah. it just, it doesn't seem like she really did her due diligence on the business to make sure that everything was above board before signing on. So that is 100% on her. I also just think in the grand scheme of things, I, you know, her scamming her fans uh, with this, I don't think it's that big of a deal. I mean, look, I want, I want influencers to be promoting good products and things that they are actually happy about and that they believe their fans will enjoy and that they will benefit from. But I mean, I'm not looking to like drag Ray over this whole thing. And I don't think you are either yeah. um, because I, mean, I think everybody, she everybody received likes Ray. Mm -hmm. I know, think she's like, incredible. So it's hard to, it's hard to try to, I mean, yes. not the point, but again, it, it's important that we all hold the influencers responsible yes. and accountable for, you know, influencing a demographic of people with yes. what legitimately, like it's so funny too, because like when she posted it and like the hate started to kind of, you had to really hunt the hate mm -hmm. because there was so much positivity from all of her, you know, support group essentially, mm -hmm. right? That it was like, for at least the first couple hours, I was like, I was thinking about buying some for Kales. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. like, it was super cool. Like, what a cool concept. Then I started talking to other people about it. So I seen a couple things. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you yeah. know? So, um, but yeah, I think that's, I think that's enough of that. Yeah. It was just uh, a mess. And, you know, hopefully Ray, her friends, other influencers learn 
from that experience because I don't think that went down very well. I mean, did you see the Pokemon announcement? I don't know if we're talking about that today. I forgot. We do. Yeah, yeah. cool. Yeah, I did. Um, <clears throat> next up, let's talk about Google and Epic. Hmm. Uh, Google has filed a counterclaim against Epic. We've talked previously on the show about the Apple uh, and Epic lawsuit and kind of how things panned out there. Um, but essentially with Epic being told that they owed Apple $6 million, it looks like Google is looking to get uh, a payback, you know, whether it's in the similar like dollar amount, who knows, but looking to kind of leverage that same legal decision to get some money uh, out of Epic. Google also alleges that they think that Epic wanted to get Fortnite banned from Google Play Store so they could sue Google. They allege that essentially Fortnite tried to sneak yeah. in a build that would get banned so that they could sue Google over this issue. I, I mean, it's definitely Epic is a little sus, and they are definitely Be a little sussy Baka. They, really, they honestly <laughs> really are, but it's you know it's it's funny overall. You know, Tim Swainy or whatever. Yeah. Uh, he's he's just trying to go after the man. He's trying to break the rules. He's trying to you know nudge the uh, nudge the envelope a little bit, if you will. Uh, and he's doing a good job of it. You know, mm -hmm. he did technically lose the lawsuit, but six million dollars to Epic is nothing. Chump and then, change. But and then also obviously in retention of that he's also getting sued again for probably let's say another six million dollars yeah. or potentially more depending on this whole he did it on purpose shenanigans and mm -hmm. what uh breaches of contract that actually causes yeah um but you know it's it's kind of interesting right because um regardless it seems that this whole thing was about being able to uh not have to pay through the pay store mm -hmm. the play store right like i don't want to have to buy my v bucks through the play store i want to be able to use x other payment method and not have to give um, Epic the or Google and Apple the thirty percent right, uh, and it kind of worked right because now they can technically yep. use other. They still have to include the Play Store component, but mm -hmm. they can also include another form of of you know accepting payment. And of course, I think that um, most people will probably still utilize the Apple Store and the Google Play Store across the board in general. Um, this might have been like a publicity stunt a little bit on the Fortnite side, potentially even too, to kind of like get some extra like clout and all that kind of jazz out of it. But I don't, I mean, honestly, I don't know. It seems like a pretty lack or like underwhelming situation now at this point. Like I feel like it's been going on for a long time. Information kind of keeps coming out of it. And it just like, doesn't really seem like anything too, because it, it felt so intense in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Epic's all releasing like propaganda videos and shit. Like, and I, I don't know, whatever. I'm glad that it's near the end of the, the life cycle. I'm glad that, Tim Schwaney was able to break the mold a little bit and kind of get the courts to agree and nudge on the whole payment component because that's mm -hmm. a nice benefit for everybody. Yeah, I mean, it's a win for the consumer um, for sure. And I'm also glad that Apple and, and Google just smacked them down and, and, and was just like, get the hell out of here and took a bunch of their money. So I'm pretty happy across the board. I think it's, I think it's pretty neutral. Uh, I'm excited, I guess, to see if there's any other like larger scale implications that I don't really know about yet, which I'm sure mm -hmm. will come out in the coming weeks or months or whatever it might be. Um, but overall, I'm mostly excited for it just to be over. Yeah, because it's like I've, it's been a long time. Because I just find it interesting that Fortnite has been essentially irrelevant. I feel like over the last year and a half, outside of these lawsuits, you're not wrong. <laughs> like the game is irrelevant, but the payment, yeah, <laughs> that's relevant. But that's still coming in, so give it to me. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, it's all interesting. We'll obviously continue to keep tabs on this. Yeah further developing situation with epic the fact that we've had to talk about this lawsuit and stuff so many times on the podcast i find it interesting but uh yeah we'll see where that one goes uh we're gonna finish off this week with a little something new do a little bit of a lightning round i got a handful of topics here luke and i are just gonna give kind of our quick first blush uh thoughts on it we'll run through them all before we end the show let's start it off with something that uh luke actually touched on a little bit ago uh pokimane mm. has been uh announced as the co-founder and chief creative officer of rts a talent management and brand consulting firm for gaming and esports uh i love it i think it's super cool mm -hmm. um it seems dope i, I love watching the influencers be able to like launch their own almost careers that mm -hmm. can then excel the scene mm -hmm. right because they know they got to the top they're like cool what's missing this i'm gonna do it myself you know what i mean and we see that we've seen that a lot in the past and um, obviously pokemon is extremely smart especially in the business side of things so i'm excited to see what she can do with it overall um, and I also love all the memes that are coming out about it because I think the company that she's a co-founder of also like owns everything. So like, I heard they own Evo. They, they, yeah, they own like Evo and a bunch of other things too. So like, buy like 
people are like making these memes of like with graphs mm -hmm. of Pokemon like owning everything. <laughs> so it's like that that's been pretty fun to look at for sure. But I would definitely take a look at it. I also want to dive into it a little bit more and like learn more about. I've been seeing different people like come onto the team as they're slowly kind of like announcing like who's gonna be working there and all that kind of stuff. So I'm pretty excited to just kind of figure out, you know, I guess what the end game goal of that overall situation is gonna be, but I like it. Sure. I like it as well. Uh especially when you contrast it to everything that happened with Ray over the last few weeks, it looks really good because uh it really seems like Pokemon did her due diligence. Uh, I agree, especially on the part of like the team that's coming on and a lot of the names that we're seeing that are going to be involved. Some very savvy, some very well-known yeah. execs that are going to be working with her. Uh, so I think RTS looks great and I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what comes out of it. I think it looks really promising. Next up, Activision Blizzard CEO Bobby Kotick to take a minimum salary till the company reaches their diversity and inclusion goals. Back to the Activision Blizzard news. Funniest shit I ever read in my life. What a joke. $62,500 is the minimum salary in the state of California, which is what he'll be getting. Uh, yeah, hold on. I wish I had a $100 bill on my hand so I could dry my tears with it. Oh, no, I'm getting it. Dude, like, how much? No, I mean, he. this was, and let's be clear, this was a decision that he made <laughs> yeah. to do. Uh, what do you, I mean? Uh, I think it's a joke. Uh, across really? the board, uh, the dude made X million of dollars last year. Sure. Who literally cares? Like, I don't. I don't think that's. I don't think it's relevant at all. It's a. Co it's a total PR stunt. The money okay. means nothing to him. Um, and you know, I can't. There's just no. There's just no purpose. The only reason to do it is for publicity. And the publicity backfired on him too because everyone thinks it's a joke. Like when mm -hmm. millionaires start talking about money, nobody cares. I agree that it is more a pr move i do i don't see I, I i don't think it's a bad move in terms of like i think it's him to an extent saying like hey i should be getting you know i shouldn't be getting all this money until we can reach these very important goals and i think the goals that were set out about um bringing more women and non-binary uh people into teams and i think they were looking to increase uh that portion by like 50 percent uh, over the next couple of years, which I think is awesome. I, I read all the goals that they set out and they look really good. Um, I do agree that it's a PR move, but in terms of when I look at like the breadth of the changes that they're looking to make and what they want to do to try and shift the culture over there, I think it's good. Is the salary thing specifically a PR move? Sure, I'll give you that. But I think overall, when you look at the entire package, how about every single exec cuts their salary until you guys fix it and you don't freaking tell the whole world day one? How about your news story leaks three months after the fact saying that the execs actually haven't been taking their salaries as they work on internal issues? Like, I just don't, it, it's, it's, it's completely pointless. Like there's, I want to see that money reinvested into the people. It, there. I just, it's just, for, I'm sorry. I'm just like, a, I'm a hard pass on this topic. Sure. When I read the, when I read the story, I literally was like, get the hell out of my face. <laughs> I was like, hey. I was like, no way, bro. But Luke has never pulled his punches against Activision Blizzard. I would not expect him to do so now, even though it is the lightning round. Next I, of course, up, I, of course, I'll end it on this. I am, of course, super pleased that it is going in a better direction. Yes. I am a long-term Blizzard fanboy yep. because I care. Luke wants to have a reason to love Blizzard again. Just one more time, bro. I have so many posters in my house. <laughs> like, help me out, guys. Next up, Ubisoft is the most hated <laughs> game developer in the world. Are you surprised? I think it's super funny. Uh, I want to give some background on the statistics real quick of the actual article yep. itself, right? Because um, I believe it was mostly, I think it was just Twitter. And mm -hmm. I think it's country-based, right? Yes, so it it's was. The, so it's like each individual country. Um, and I believe Just, they were the most hated in 23 countries. That sounds all right. I'm yeah. not surprised at all. Uh, I, I, I've had so many issues with Ubisoft games in the past. I can't even. I won't even get into any stories because it's the lightning round. But Just holy don't, crap! Don't mention For Honor. Yeah, For so Honor. Weird. Don't talk about it with me because <laughs> I've I've never been able to successfully play that game. But no, uh, you Ubisoft a makes mess. a ton of sense. I know Game Freak is on that list as well with the whole Pokemon chibacle and stuff. I'm most surprised that a Activision Blizzard isn't higher on the list yep. based on everything that's been going on. But again, I know it's cult, uh, cultural and, and country-based, so yep. that's probably why. I also don't know the exact date this was done. Uh, but two, where the hell's EA at? Like, I, I, I talked about this like a long time ago on the podcast. Shout out to EA for like not being the most hated game developer. Because they, let's be clear, like, those they guys owned it. Weren't they voted like one of the worst places to work? Yeah, they've been, for, they've like, been voted multiple the worst years for a while. Like a so, bunch of times. Good on you, EA. You're making a comeback. Yeah, dude. So my, my uh, lightning round answer is shout out to EA. Yes. 
yeah, for reference, Game Freak was the most hated dev in uh, the United States and Canada. Getting a lot of flack for the stuff they do with Pokemon. Bring me the national decks in Sword and Shield. <laughs> Now, just flip the switch. You I can demand do it. it. I know you can do it. Uh, next up, C9 Blue win the North American LCQ will be the final North American representative at the coming Valorant World Championship. Dope. I'm down. I'm in. I'm completely I'm sold. In. I, I literally Rest in can't. peace, Hunter Thieves. I've been watching nothing but League of Legends, mm -hmm. so I'm super excited to flip the switch back to Valorant. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. We get a little bit of a break. I think it's like start of December. We'll yeah. get that tournament. It's going to be sick. That's good because I'm not ready right now. I need a little <laughs> bit of time. We need a breath, yeah. Riot. Let me let me take a break. Uh, last story of the day, Team Esports Arena ends the first half of split one of the ALGS Pro League. First over all they have not finished worse than third place on a single weekend yet second place uh weeks one and two and third place this past weekend uh i'm super excited i love the boys Duke, mm -hmm. skittles and and uh, verholst they're they're so cool great guys uh, they've been a lot of props in the whole community all yep. the big all the big shots which i love to see uh they're dope they're gonna keep doing an incredible job um and again guys they're competing with the best right they're competing with with the, the TSMs and yeah. the team. The team, TSM is so good. Complexity is so good. You know what I mean? Liquid is so good. Like, they're all, it, it's such a different level of competition. And being able to watch, of course, Esports e Arena's brand, yep. but also these these guys who really formed and grew up through Series E and getting an actual opportunity to, like, dominate. Mm -hmm. It's so cool to see. It's so fun. You know, we've been having a blast on Twitter, just going back and forth with all the different players. Mm -hmm. And it's always a big fiasco. But, you know, we love it. It's all in fun for us, you know, because we really just, we love the competition. We love seeing everybody play. And, you know, we have big love for almost all of the teams, really, because mm -hmm. we work so closely with all the players and the talent, the, the, the influencers and everything, that it is it is such a rewarding experience to be able to watch every week and not only see esports arena's brand but again but competing with all of these other players and brands that we work with every day with series e i've been loving it uh and i can't wait to to keep watching the boys dominate i'm excited three more uh weeks after uh, a short break for them to finish off uh at least the regular season for split one uh they've looked incredible they've been looking really consistent uh they continue to put up solid kill numbers solid numbers uh just on the scoreboard in general um you know i had high expectations for this squad at the start of season three of series e and they continue to exceed them so uh really love to see it um excited to see how they play the rest of the split and excited to see them back again as well for uh 10k this weekend and for season four of series e. it's going to be awesome uh but that's going to do it for everything we wanted to talk about before we go luke what have you been playing this last week uh tft new pve set on yes. uh, season six for that i've been playing a little bit uh still got a little bit of new world here and there okay. um but honestly I, I didn't game too much this week so that's about okay. it okay nice little nice little vacay um some valorant here a little bit also jumped on a little bit of apex a lot of league Lately, mm -hmm. I've been trying to finish up Played the like missions. One game. Yeah, I've been trying to finish up the world's missions because I want to get the uh, the Morgana prestige skin. So mm -hmm. I need uh, the 2,200 points to buy the 100 prestige points so I can get that prestige skin because I really want it. And because those points are going to expire uh, in like February and there's not going to be any other skins that I want. So I'm like, I need to get this skin. So that's it. I was like grinding. I played probably 10 ARAMs last night and I was actually having a lot of fun. So Solid. yeah, love it. Uh, but that's going to do it for us, folks. 11 episodes in the books. Thanks so much for joining us once again. Of course, if you guys want to listen, we're on YouTube. We're on Apple Podcasts. We're on Spotify. Just look up Eat, Speak, Compete. We'll be over there. If you ever want to ask us questions, talk about what we talked about on the show, uh, Luke is at Shimonahi on Twitter. I am at Caster Yeso. It is always a pleasure to be here with you all. Enjoy the rest of your week. Enjoy World Finals this weekend. And make sure you tune in to the 10K. We got our series event this Saturday, November 6th at 2 p.m. Pacific time. We're gonna have 20 of the best teams in North America duking it out for a share of $10,000. So you're not gonna wanna miss out on that. It'll be over at twitch.tv forward slash esports arena. Hope you guys enjoyed the show and have a great rest of your week. Peace. Mm -hmm.